This is a set of videos um, showing how to write a Hello World program using an, using ASM86 or Assembler86. Um, it's very much based on Ben Eater's fantastic set of videos using the 6802 16-bit microprocessor from Motorola. He goes through a set of YouTube videos uh, showing how to write a little program to write Hello World to an LCD display using a 6802 processor from Micro Motorola. I wanted to use the 8086 16-bit um, microprocessor from Intel. And yes, there are emulators you can use on a PC and, and you can actually write the code on an emulator and you can write Hello World quite si quickly and simply um, using that emulator. I didn't want to actually use an emulator, I wanted to actually build an actual microprocessor, just as Ben Eater had done, but using the 8086, the Intel 8086 microprocessor, uh, rather than the Motorola one. Um, here we have a, a, an Intel uh, from 1978, an 8086-2, and here we have the data sheet for the 8086, uh, 8086 and the um, pinout. You'll see the 8086-2 is an 8 megahertz clock. Um, now, I don't want to use an 8 megahertz clock um, because if we were going to try to sort of step through or look at this in slow motion to see what actually happens and what is actually going on with the microprocessor, um, we need to run it much slower. So I want to run a clock rate of maybe a pulse a second or two pulses a second. If it's running at two pulses a second, then we can see exactly what's going on and how the microprocessor is actually reacting to the clock pulse. Um, unfortunately, if you try to run the 8086 at anything else that, other than the, the clock cycle it's designed for, it won't work. Um, now, why I'm deciding to use the 8086 is because back in the day, um, I worked for Marconi Radar and there were computers didn't exist, so we had to build our own. And this is the uh, computer we built uh, in Marconi Radar in Chelmsford. Um, here we're using the Intel 8086, so we built this in the early 80s and this is one of the set from uh, Lucas 16 and, and this is the processor board. It uses code in these EEPROMs and it's got some RAM and it's got a crystal and a UART and a air traffic controller as this was the computer board that we designed and built and we coded in assembler to run air traffic control. So if you live in the UK or even Ireland um, and have flown over UK airspace, you'll have used our software to guide you safely. Um, the air traffic controllers use this to um, see the plots on the display and uh, direct traffic um, through UK airspace. So my plan was really to use the 86 because I'm now retired and wanted to go back to the days when we wrote Assembler and when we wrote the code for this computer. Well, this is well before Bill Gates or um, Wozniak was about. We had to build our own computers when the 86 came out. It was the ideal processor we used then to uh, write code and build the air traffic control systems. Um, so I'm actually going to build on a breadboard uh, using an 80C86. The 80C86 is a CMOS version of the 8086 and it means that we can run it at a slower clock pulse. So eventually we're going to go uh, and the clock pulse here is on pin 19 and we're going to run a, a slow clock pulse through this uh, and we'll see how this actually operates. The Intel um, microprocessor you'll see here has outputs of address lines, um, but as you'll see, the address lines start at pin 16, uh, run up to address line 14 on pin 2, then on 15 all the way through to pin 35. So there's actually 20 address lines. But as you'll see, it's also saying it's AD0. So actually, it, not only is it the address line, but it's also the data line. So what Intel did was they used a thing called multiplexing, where on one clock cycle, it would be the address line, and on another track cycle, it would be the data line. The idea was reduce the number of pins, put it onto a 40-pin package like this, uh, and you could have the address line and the data lines using the same pin. Um, so we'll have to discuss how that actually operates and how we're able to identify when it's an address line and how we actually identify when it's a data line. Um, and so that's part of the, the video series of going through of showing you how that's actually done. Um, so we will come back to that at a later stage. Here I have the 8086 uh, pinout and I've connected my 80C86 uh, to the breadboard that I'm going to use. 
The ADC 86, as I explained, uh, allows me to run at lower clock speed, but it's got exactly the same functionality as the 8086 microprocessor. Before I start, I'll need to connect the top rail of the breadboard uh, to the bottom rail, so I connect on the positive side. To here, and then the negative top rail to the bottom, like so. Uh, I'm going to start at the pin 1 through to pin 40. And pin one is ground, so I'll connect pin one to the ground rail. And pin 40 to plus five volts. Next pin 2 all the way through to 16 are the address lines and the data lines. As I say, on one clock cycle there will be the address lines, on the other clock cycle there will be the data lines. Uh, so we jump straight to pin 17 and 18. These are non-maskable interrupt and interrupt. Uh, an interrupt I'm not really going to get into because we're not going to really use interrupts in these series of videos. But an interrupt tells the processor to stop executing what it's doing and, and uh, manage the code associated with the interrupt. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to hold those to ground so there is no interrupts being generated. So that's pin 17 to ground. And pin 18 to ground. Pin 19 is the clock, and later on I'll build a little clock circuit uh, using a 555 timer, and we'll connect that to the clock signal. Pin 20 is ground, so I'll just connect that directly to ground. Pin 21 is the reset signal, uh, and I'll have to generate our, or build a little reset circuit, and I'll come back to that uh, along with the clock circuit. Pin 22 is ready, and it's used by the memory or I.O. to say ready. It's active high, so I'm just going to hold that to plus 5. Pin 22. Okay. Pin 23 is test, uh, and that's uh, if that's held low, exe execution of the processor continues. So I'm just going to connect that directly to ground. The next set of pins, 24 through to 31, you'll see here it's saying uh, S1, S0, but it's also got other ones in brackets here. This is because the 8086 can be set into a maximum mode or minimum mode. Um, we're going to run it in minimum mode. In maximum mode, you have to use other external signals, but we're going to use the signals within the microprocessor itself. Uh, if I go through the data sheet, um, you will see um, it's describing what the pins are here with the address lines and what pins they are. And if we go on to the next page, you'll see here at the bottom it's saying the following pin functions are for the 8086 system in maximum mode. So these pins 20, 26 to 28 are status lines, but we're going to go and use it in minimum mode. So if we go over the page until we get to minimum mode. And here it's saying the following pin functions are for the 8086 in minimum mode. Um, we can actually set one of the pins uh, to define that uh, as the min or maximum. So I'll just proceed with the pins. Uh, I'll go back to the pin out. Okay. So pin 24 is interrupt. It's an output, so I'll ignore that. Pin 25 is ALE, 
and this is the latch address. This is what I spoke of before, which goes high when there is a dress line. So we're going to use this ALE output later on. And we can. what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a LED to uh, that pin and I'll attach a yellow LED. And when that then goes high, that LED will light. So I'll come back to that later. Pin 26 is data enable. It's an output, so I'm going to ignore that one from now. Uh, DTR, which is data transmit received, is an output, so I'll ignore that on pin 27. Pin 28 is MIO, which is a status line, to output for memory or IO. It's an output, so I'll ignore that. Uh, pin 29 is WR or write. So this indicates when the CPU is doing a write to memory or IO. It's active O, sorry, active low. So I'm going to connect that to a green LED later on, and we can see when the, when the LED lights, when the green LED lights, that it's doing a right. So I'll leave that just for the moment. Pins 30 and 31 are hold and hold A, and it's used to communicate to other devices. So I'm going to leave 30 and put 31 to ground. Pin 32 is read. Uh, the CPU is doing a memory or IO read uh, and it's active low. So I connect a, a, a blue LED to that later on and we can see whenever it's doing a, lead, a, a read and the blue LED will light. Pin 33 is min or max mode and this defines whether it's in minimum or maximum and I'm going to hold it high um, as it's in minimum. Connect that pin Hi, to the plus rail. Uh, pin 34 is bus high enable status. It's an output, like, so I ignore it. Pins 35 to 39 are address A15 to A19, or address, or sorry, data 15. And pin 40 is the power. So I'm going to come back to the address lines um, and data lines. Uh, I'm going to extend these out and then attach LEDs to them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is pin 16, pin 15, pin 14, pin 13. I'm going to extend out. So if we go to pin 16 and connect that out over to this line here. Pin 16, or sorry, pin 15. I'll extend that out to here. Fourteen. To here. And thirteen. Is that in there? Okay, so this will have address or data 0, 1, 2, and 3. So 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we'll then connect LEDs and use a resistor. So the idea is that when the address or the data line goes high, uh, it'll light this LED. Um, and I'm going to connect in four of these little LEDs. Um, on the LED, there's a flat part of the LED, and that will show you which is the, the this this bar here, and that's the piece we're going to connect to ground. So I'll connect in these LEDs. One, two, and four. And this will be address 0, 1, 2, and 3, or data 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then I connect in the uh, 220 ohm resistor. So connect from this pin to this LED. The next extended line from here. That LED. Mm 
Just one here. And then the fourth LED. I'm going to extend the most significant dress lines of A16, A17, A18 and A19 and I'm not going to extend the address lines of AD14 through to AD15 as I think the breadboard just becomes too cluttered. But I will be adding a yellow, green and blue LED. The ALE pin 25 will be yellow, the WR pin 29 to green and the pin 32 RD to blue. Yellow LED will then light on ALE address latch and the green LED will light when the processor is writing and the blue LED will light when the processor is reading. Note that the ALE yellow goes high when the signal is active so the LED will be connected to ground as here but for the other two, blue and green, they are active low so the LED will be connected to plus 5 and the limiting resistor added. Uh, the resistor added just to ensure the current doesn't blow up the LED or the processor. Finally, I'll add a clock circuit using a 555 tim timer to generate a clock pulse. So let's connect these most significant address lines. Uh, I'll start with A19 pin 35. Pin 36, address 18. Pin 37, A17. And pin 38. Okay. And then connect the LEDs. And then the limiting resistor. Okay, now we need to connect the yellow LED, which is going to be the ALE, and we'll connect these. Uh, now this connects to ground. The green, which will connect to positive rail, and the blue, which will connect to the positive rail, because those two signals are active low. 
Then I'm connecting the limiting resistors. So if I do the blue one first. And this will connect to pin 32. Squeeze it in here, pin 32, just in there. Connect a green one. Pin twenty nine. So twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine. Just double check that. Twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine. And finally, ALE. Connect the resistor. I want it to ALE, which is pin twenty five. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Just kind of squeeze that in there. And I got that correct there. 22, 23, 24, 25. Okay. Uh, I'll now go on to create the clock circuit. Uh, clock will connect into pin 19 and we can then run the clock signal and power the board up and see how it performs. Now we need to provide a clock signal uh, to the microprocessor and we want a fairly slow clock pulse so that we can actually see what's going on um, and two pulses every second seems to be about right then we can actually watch what goes on as we connect that to the microprocessor and the default for a clock signal or for any pulses is the 555 timer it's a little 8 pin chip I uh, find them on eBay and in fact, if you put in 555 timer into Google, you'll see there are a load of circuits. Uh, and so I'm going to use this little 555 timer to generate my clock pulse. I'm just going to use this circuit over here and we'll connect it in that way. So first of all, I just connect a little. Chip in like so. There we go. And then I need to connect the top plus five rail to the lower five rail and the negative rail to the lower negative rail on the breadboard. And then the same with the negative rail, connect the negative rail on the top, negative rail on the bottom. And then we need to power the chip and the chip uh, powered from pin 8 is plus 5 so if we connect the uh, pin 8 to the positive rail 
as I say, the, the way you know which of the pins is there's a little groove in the front end. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but there's a little groove in the front end of the IC and the pins go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So pin eight, we connect to the plus rail and one pin one goes to ground. So if we connect this pin one to the ground rail, Like so, that's the power bar, pin one and uh, pin eight. Uh, next, if we just follow it round, you'll see pin six and pin two are actually connected together. So if we loop pin two to pin six, if I connect this little loop I've created, a short wire into pin two and pin six. Loops around to pin two and six, connects those, and then between pin two is the 4.7 microfarad capacitor. Uh, basically, the 555 timer is just using a, a resistor capacitor, so it, it's charging that capacitor through the resistor, and that's what gives us our pulse. Uh, the internals of the 555 timer generator will then generate our clock pulse. So what we need to do is connect pin two and ground a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. And here I have an electrolytic one. Now you have to be careful with the electrolytic capacitors that they're connected the right way around. There is a positive and negative side on an electrolytic capacitor. So here you can see there's a, a negative sign on there indicating which is the one that goes to ground. So we just connect that between pin two and ground. Uh, next is pin three. Now pin three is actually where we're going to get our clock signal. So we'll actually connect a, a line into pin three and to the Microsoft uh, microprocessor's uh, clock input. But so we can see it uh, and so we can see it flashing, we're going to connect an, a 220 ohm resistor and an LED. The 220 ohm resistor is to limit the current being drawn uh, through the LED so it doesn't blow up the LED. Now, so put the little 220 ohm resistor in and it connects into pin three and here and then we need to connect the LED on the other end of that 220 ohm resistor. Now we need to find the negative side of the LED. Now it doesn't actually matter if you put the LED in the wrong way around. If it doesn't light you just switch it over. Um, it won't do any damage to the LED by just connecting it the wrong way around. But how we identify which is the cathode and which is the one that goes to the negative side is there's a little flat on the side of an LED. Um, now you probably can't see it very well in this video but you'll, you'll see if you've got one in front of you that there's a little flat side and that's the cathode. So this in this um, flat side indicates this bar here and that's the piece we're going to connect to ground. So if we connect one side of ground and another side this side to the end of the uh, 220 ohm resistor like so. Okay, so pin four is a uh, to connects to plus five. So if we connect pin four to the plus rail, there we go. And pin five, pin five is control signal, and to prevent the control signal uh, wandering about, we'll just connect it across a little zero point zero one microfarad capacitor. So here I have, now this is an electrolytic, this is a ceramic capacitor, so it doesn't matter which way around you put this capacitor. Um, so this 0 0.01 microfarad, we connect it to pin five. So one, two, three, four, and five, and into ground. So if we put that in there, and then we'll need to connect in the negative Uh, pin 6 uh, has the 100k resistor and pin 7 has the 1k resistor. Well, if we connect pin 7 first, uh, we've got a 1k resistor between the positive rail and pin 7. So 
I connect my 1k resistor between 7 and the positive rail like that and then finally between 7 and 6 is the 100k resistor now I have this little 100k resistor and I just bend it over in a little loop so I can easily connect it between pin 7 and pin 6 okay and now the proof comes for when we connect in the power so if I connect my power in and switch it on and there we have it there is the clock signal being generated at about two pulses every second and that should be slow enough to connect to our uh, microprocessor uh, the other signal we need to provide for the microprocessor is the reset signal but i think i'll call an end to part one here and in part two we'll see how we generate the reset signal and connect it into our microprocessor and we can see how it behaves with the clock signal and the reset connected